Tonight, if you have your Bibles, please open to the book of Esther. It's actually, uh, though some wondered why this book ever got into the Bible, and we heard that last week, it's one of my favorite books in the Bible. <clears throat> you may have heard uh, the news this week uh, that Eli Wiesel passed away. I think he was 87 years old. And uh, one of, probably the best known Holocaust survivor in the world. Really, he, he's traveled the world and he's fought for more than just the cause of uh, his own people, the Jews, but he's fought for the rights of uh, persecuted people around the world. And uh, his name is up there. You should really uh, look into his story. He wrote a book called Night, and this was his experience. There's pictures of him when he was actually in uh, one of the concentration camps when they were being uh, delivered. And there's a picture of him in his little bunk. You've seen these horrible pictures, and they're wearing those striped suits, and there was Eli Wiesel. And uh, he lost his mother and father, lost most of his family, and uh, came out. And in this book, Night, he, he really talks about how he had this dream to be a rabbi as a young person. And when he went through the Holocaust, it was all gone. Uh, his dreams went up in smoke. He, he really went through the dark night of the soul and, and lost his faith. And it's very interesting that this book of Esther was a book the Germans did not want the Jews to be reading when they were in the concentration camps. It was just too close to what they were actually doing. So if you know the whole book of Esther, you know, you know what I mean by that. And so the Nazi regime wanted to exterminate the German people. And uh, they survived. And that is not what the Nazis wanted. But in the book of Esther, they survived. Well, they couldn't stop the Jews because they had memorized this book. Jewish people memorized the book of Esther. Every year in the Feast of Purim, they read through the entire book of Esther. They quote it. So they couldn't stop it. And uh, I find it amazing for that. There's a lot of parallels. If you think of Holocaust education, the book of Esther, there, there's a connection there. <clears throat> As you think of uh, Esther, you also, I'm going to ask if somebody can get me a glass of water. I'm going to die up here. Thank you, Jason. Jason's gone to do it. And I'm going to take off my jacket, if you don't mind. Be more comfortable. I'm more comfortable. You'll be more comfortable. And as we think of providence, uh, it's one of the key words that describes the book of Esther. When you think of the sovereignty of God, we're thinking about the rule of God over everything. And you might find that word actually in the Bible, sovereign Lord. I mean, you might not. You will find that word, sovereign Lord. You will not find the word providence, even though what it means in English is clearly in the Bible. And it has to do with within the rule of God over everything, God's particular dealings at different times with different nations and in particular different people. And when you see a group of people or a person suffer greatly, there's great potential for that person to be greatly used. And you see that with the person of Esther. One of the details that comes out in the passage tonight is that Esther loses her mother and her father. And I, th I think of Samuel when I think of that. I think of Samuel's two little children. You know, a one-year-old and a three-year-old, they lost their mother. But that story's not finished, and we need to pray for Samuel that he would see himself in the sovereignty of God, and God's providential dealings with him are in love. And everything that God does, oh, thank you so much, that God does for us is through Jesus Christ. And so we heard last week that God is not mentioned in the book of Esther. Messiah is not mentioned. There are no prayers in the book of Esther. And yet we see the un seeing the invisible hand of God uh, working behind the scenes. It's clear. It's so clear. I believe that's why in the providence of God, this book actually made it into the Bible. <laughs> it was undeniable. We're going to pause here and pray and then uh, ease ourselves into the text. Father, we come before you tonight. We are so thankful for your dealings in our life. Some of them are painful. Others are are glorious and wonderful. And Lord, we know that you do cause all things to work together for the good. We pray tonight as we open the book of Esther that you would help us with this, to see it, to understand it, 
and to see ourselves in the book, to see your providential dealings with us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we see uh, from last week, when the crown was taken off Vashti's head, we're going to see tonight the crown will now go on to Esther's head. And uh, there's actually four years of time that elapses. And you'll see that there's a time marker at the end of the passage. And if you do, you know, chapter one, chapter two, do the math, it's four years. Also in the providence of God, there was a historian in the world at the time who was writing about what was happening in the world. His name was Herodotus. And he writes about Xerxes, the very man that was introduced last week, King Xerxes, the king of Persia. And how at this very time, in those four years, he was off fighting a war with the Greeks, which he lost. <laughs> so he loses his wife, and he goes into war, he loses a war, and uh, he depletes the finances of the nation. And so he must have come back pretty dejected. And uh, so that's important to see that. What can we learn about Xerxes tonight as we begin to go into the passage? We're going to see Mordecai introduced, Esther is introduced, and like Daniel and their friends, we're going to see their names are also changed. Daniel and friends had their names changed to Babylonian names. They had two names. Well, Mordecai and Esther are actually those changed names. Hadassah is her Jewish name, Esther, which really in English it's Ishtar, so one of the goddesses, the goddess of war and love. And Mordecai is Marduk, also a god. And so let me begin now, chapter 2, verse 1. Later, when King Xerxes' fury had subsided, he remembered Vashti and what she had done and what he had decreed about her. There may be some sadness in there. Maybe he's remembering his wife. That's four years. Verse 2, then the king's personal attendants proposed. It's always dangerous when someone proposes something to a politician. Let a search be made for a beautiful or for beautiful young virgins for the king. I almost said beautiful uh, singular. It's many young virgins. Let the king appoint commissioners or agents in every province of his realm to bring all these beautiful young women into the harem at the citadel of Susa. There's actually 127 provinces, so that's where they're drawing from. Let them be placed under the care of Hege, the king's eunuch, who's in charge of the women. And by the way, I'll just pause here. Uh, the eunuchs, here's where you see the real need for eunuchs. They're in charge of very beautiful virgins who were brought to the king. And so Herodotus tells us that every year, 500 boys, if you think it was terrible to be a virgin taken from your family, they would also take boys, 500, and castrate them and make them eunuchs, and they would serve in the king's palace and they would serve in the kingdom. So all this is going on. And let beauty treatments be given to them. Then let the young women who pleases the king be, uh, sorry, let me read that again. Let then let the young woman who pleases the king be queen instead of Ashti. This advice appealed to the king, and he followed it. So you wonder, you know, what kind of a king is this? Why would this advice appeal to him? It seems to me that Xerxes has a, a lot of issues going on in his life. You see one clearly in the text. He certainly has an anger issue. You know, he held on to this anger for quite a long time until his anger subdued, his fury, it says, until it was subdued, until uh, he released it. It subsided. He has this kind of anger, and he also has absolute power in his kingdom. <laughs> That's kind of a scary combination. He also has, it would seem, immense pride. Now, not all the kings are exactly alike. You read about Nebuchadnezzar, you read about Darius, Xerxes, his father, Artaxerxes, they're not all exactly the same. This guy seems to have maybe a little more pride uh, than others, maybe a little less than Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar had huge, huge pride. But Herodotus tells us that usually the wives would come from seven families. There were seven key families they would choose wives from. But here, he's going to 127 provinces. So, you know, big choice, big selection. 
only one would be chosen and the rest of the women would go into a harem for the rest of their lives in luxury, but certainly loneliness. Imagine being, you know, for one night and then that's it, you're, you're done. This king also is easily manipulated, and you see that with the kings of the East. Nebuchadnezzar, Darius, Xerxes, they're easily manipulated by those who are close to them. Those who have the smarts, often the magicians and astrologers and the advisors knew how to manipulate the king, and it was dangerous because they were close to this kind of power, this unstable power that you see in this man. You know, he can burst in fury, he has great pride, but if you were wise and knew how to manipulate him, and often it would be getting one of your daughters into that harem and maybe she would become the wife, and then you really have possibility uh, for manipulation. I want you to notice as we continue reading where providence places different people. And though God is never mentioned in the book, there are no prayers mentioned, there's no mention of the Messiah, you see clearly this unseen hand guiding the, event, uh, the events in the story. Verse 5. Now we meet Mordecai. Now there was in the citadel of Susa a Jew of the tribe of Benjamin named Mordecai, son of Jair, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, who had been carried into exile from Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, among those taken captive with Jehoiachin, king of Judah. There's a lot of wonderful historical data there. So you've gone from one empire to another. You've gone from the Babylonians. Now we're in Persia. And here we see it's clearly rooted in Jewish history. This is the exile. So there's no mention of God, but you're getting connected to another book of the Bible or books of the Bible. And uh, we can remember that the time that's being spoken of is Jeremiah, Daniel. These are close books to this one. If you were in the Bible turning to this, you would have gone Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther. And so those first two books are post-exile. This is exile. So we're rooted in history, and we see the ancestry of uh, Mordecai. What tribe did he come from? It says it right in the text. The tribe of Benjamin, and the last name mentioned was son of Kish. That's not something you eat. That's a Kish, right? Real men eat Kish. This is the son of Kish. And that should ring a bell. If you've been in Sunday school, who does that sound like? Tribe of Benjamin, son of Kish. Anybody remember the name of the first king of Israel was Saul. So Mordecai has blue blood. He comes from that. We'll put that aside for now, but later in the story, this will become an important detail. It seems that Mordecai, he doesn't know it now, but he's been providentially placed in this story for uh, a significant reason. And now we're going to see Esther. She's introduced. Verse 7. Mordecai had a cousin named Hadassah, whom he had brought up because she had neither father nor mother. This young woman, who was also known as Esther, had a lovely figure and was beautiful. Mordecai had taken her as his own daughter when her father and mother died. So they're cousins, but he's a much older cousin. And so Providence places her in the hall of fame for beauty. She's clearly a very beautiful woman. The rabbis actually tell us they considered her among the four most beautiful women in the world. Sarah, Rahab, Abigail, remember Abigail and David, and Esther. That's their opinion, but she was clearly a very beautiful woman. Verse eight, when the king's order and edict had been proclaimed, Many young women were brought to the citadel of Susa and put under the care of Hege. Esther, now notice the word, was also taken. She was taken to the king's palace and entrusted to Hege, who had charge of the harem. Now we're, myself and Pastor Chris and Nick and George, we're going to be teaching this, and uh, the books we're using, one a key one is a commentary written by 
uh, a female uh, Bible scholar, and her expertise is in the book of Esther. She's devoted herself to this book. And so we've been reading through, and she's the one that asks this question, what is a good Jewish girl like Esther doing in a place like this? <laughs> it's a, a kind of an interesting question. And uh, there's a lot that's not said in the text, and so when you read a commentary on Esther, you have to be careful because there's so much that is not said you have to read carefully what the commentator says and maybe balance it out with what another commentator says. And I found that to be very true uh, this week as, as I was going through this. Karen Jobes is, is wonderful, but she comes down a little hard on Esther. She wonders, because she has two names, was she living, and her and Mordecai also, were they living two lives? Were the rest of the Jews, the whole nation kind of a secular nation now. Here they're just trying to survive in Persia. It's a difficult place to be. And so in public, she's Esther, you know, in the harem. But in private, she's a Jew. And she's concealed her identity. We don't know. Compared to Daniel, um, it's different. Daniel does not assimilate into the culture as much as Esther had to in a harem. And so it's very interesting when you read the book of Daniel, which is happening right around the same time. Daniel goes from Babylon, and he's also in Persia. He's part of that journey. And so compare Daniel to the book of Esther, some very interesting comparisons and contrasts. I said Job is quite tough on Esther, but she does say there's some tremendous growth in Esther as a person, in her character, in her leadership. And the events that happen in the book will force her to uh, integrate these two identities, the private and the public. Uh, they will come out together, and we'll see that in a later chapter. Verse 8 says that she was taken. So it's very passive. She's taken into the harem. But later on, we'll see that Esther takes events into her own hands. She takes control. She becomes a leader of her own. Now, on the other side, we might say, well, what choice did she have in any of this? She's a young lady, and Mordecai, we're going to see, commands her uh, to do something. Let's keep reading now, and I want you to notice um, the hand of God again in Esther's life. Verse 9, we read, as she's in the harem, she pleased him, that's Hege the eunuch, she pleased him and won his favor. Immediately, he provided her with beauty treatments and special food. He assigned her to seven female attendants and selected, uh, that were selected from the king's palace and moved her in and her attendants into the best place in the harem. Now, the ladies are probably saying, wow, wasn't she lucky to be put in the best place of the harem? Did she really want to be there? The text is silent. We don't know. What is Esther thinking? We don't know. The text is silent. What is her motivation? Is she really focusing on the, the throne? Is she a power person? The text doesn't say. We don't know. It's silent. Verse 10, Esther had not revealed her nationality and family background because Mordecai had forbidden her to do so. So what choice did she have in a strongly male-oriented patriarchal culture where her older cousin who's taking care of her commands her to do something. So I think we have to be careful about being overly harsh with Esther. Verse 11, every day he walked to and fro near the courtyard of the harem to find out how Esther was and what was happening to her. Even his walking there, we'll see next week, is providential. God is dealing with something, and he will hear something that becomes very important down the road in the story. Now, scholars are also tough on Mordecai. If Mordecai is the one taking care of Esther, you know, and commanding her not to reveal her um, identity, her Jewishness, which is opposite to Daniel, Daniel would not eat the king's meat. It's pretty hard for Esther to not eat the food put before her, to keep kosher, to keep the Sabbath. She's Jewish. Well, in the harem, I don't know how much work they'd be doing anyway. So maybe it's not so hard to keep, uh, keep the Sabbath. But sexual relationships with the king, that's another matter. And so 
scholars say, what was Mordecai doing putting her in such a situation? Did he have some way of stopping this and controlling it? The text doesn't really tell us. It seems it's a dangerous time and it's easy to be tough. We're sitting here and we're not in, in their shoes. There's other ways to look at this. So we can ask the question, could Esther keep the Torah regulations while living in the king's harem? We don't know. Uh, could she obey her uncle and the Torah at the same time? We don't really know that she disobeyed the Torah. The text doesn't say. It's silent about all this. It's silent about her motivation. It's silent about her emotions, her feelings, her thoughts. We don't know. And people want to get in there. Now, it's interesting, the Greek translation, the LXX as it's called, completely exonerates her by inserting material in their translation that's not even here in the, uh, what's called the Masoretic text, and put words in her mouth where she says, I did not violate the Torah and I abhorred the bed of a Gentile king. But we don't find that in the book of Esther here. So they're trying to exonerate her uh, kind of right on, uh, on the pages. So we could say, as we put all this together, that Esther is less than perfect, Mordecai perhaps even more less than perfect, and it would be hard for her to sing the song, Dare to be a Daniel, <laughs> or for Mordecai certainly to sing that song, Dare to be a Daniel. However, they're perfectly placed in this story to do God's will. It would seem that the, unhand, or the unseen hand of God has placed them in a position uh, to do something. We'll see those great words that come from Mordecai to Esther when he challenges her, have you not come to this position for a time such as this? You, you've been placed here. They're less than perfect, but against all odds, they're going to survive destructive worldly forces. And they're going to be used by God to save their entire people from these destructive forces. Why? It's the invisible hand of God that's guiding the whole story. And why must this people survive the bigger story? Like as you think of the book of Esther amongst the other books of the Bible, what's the bigger story that's happening? Even though the Messiah isn't mentioned in this book, who will come from this people that survives? The Messiah. That's why they had to survive. This story is so crucial. And we're going to develop that more down the road. Now we're going to go to the rest of the story uh, for tonight, beginning at verse 12. And so if you like makeup and cosmetics and stuff like that, I do, actually I moisturize. Verse 12, don't tell anybody. Before a young woman's turn came to go into King Xerxes, she had to complete 12 months of beauty treatments. Imagine the spa bill for that. Prescribed for the women, six months with the oil of myrrh and six with perfumes and cosmetics. And this is how she would go to the king. Anything she wanted was given to her to take with her from the harem to the king's palace in brackets. This usually meant the finest clothing and beautiful jewelry. That's really what's meant. And that was for her to keep. Verse 14. In the evening she would go there and in the morning return to another part of the harem to the care of Shashgaz, the king's eunuch was in charge of the concubines, and she would not return to the king unless he was pleased with her and summoned her by name. And all the women are gagging by now, I hope. <laughs> That's the culture of that time. Keep going. Uh, verse 15, when the turn came for Esther, the young woman Mordecai had adopted, the daughter of his uncle Abihail, to go to the king, she asked for nothing other than what Haggai, the king's eunuch, who was in charge of the harem, suggested. Hear these words. And Esther won the favor of everyone who saw her. She was taken to King Xerxes in the royal residence in the 10th month, the month of Tebeth, in the seventh year of his reign. There's your time marker. It tells you four years. Verse 17, now the king was attracted to Esther more than to any of the other women. 
and she won his favor and approval more than any of the other virgins. So he set the royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. And the king gave a great banquet, Esther's banquet, for all his nobles and officials. He proclaimed a holiday throughout the provinces and distributed gifts with royal liberality. Now, all this attention was to please the vanity of the king. It tells you this guy had a big ego. <laughs> Everything was for him. No expense was spared. And from 127 provinces, all these women were taken care of. Imagine the cost so one of them could become the king's wife and all the rest for the rest of their lives would be in the harem. And again, you know, the bill is picked up by the taxes. In humility, she takes counsel, Esther does, from Mordecai and from Haggai, asks for nothing and goes in with the beauty the Lord has given her. What are her feelings? I don't know. What did she feel in this experience? I can't imagine. The text is silent. What would Ezra say? Remember Ezra and Nehemiah? He was the guy that pulled out beards. I think he might have pulled out a few from Mordecai. Just maybe. I don't know. But again, the text doesn't say. Some larger questions come for us from this tonight. When you think of living in the world we live in, very pagan society, uh, secular might be a better word. How much do we conceal, let's say in dangerous times, our identity? Are we ever supposed to conceal our identity? They did here. To do so means some degree of assimilation into the culture. And Esther and Mordecai do assimilate to a certain degree. How much and how close is too close before you're swallowed up? Those are really difficult questions to ask. Job's, the female commentator, asks the question and she says, is Esther a model of faith at this point? She compares him to Joseph. Joseph rose to high office the hard way. She rose, certainly the easier way, through a harem. But others say she didn't have much choice. And I think I lean with those ones. She didn't have much choice. Pastor Chris last week talked about the moral ambiguity of this book, that this book is, is reflecting the messy times. These are Jews in exile. They're not in their own nation. God has placed the whole nation from Babylon into Persia for big purposes. And so right and wrong isn't always easy to see. It's more clear in the book of Daniel. It's not as clear in the book of Esther. It seems that the grace of God and the mercy of God is poured out upon Esther and upon Mordecai, and God uses them greatly. We're reading her book today, aren't we? And we're going to see uh, more and more as we go along. The main point of the story is actually the providence of God. Even though it's not said in the text, you can see it. What are the chances that a Jewish girl who is in exile who loses her parents, probably has very poor education, uh, doesn't know the culture as well as the girls that are born in that culture, that she would rise from being an exile to become the queen in Persia. What are the chances that the unseen hand of God is moving to make all this happen? And she doesn't even know the big purpose. She doesn't see what God is doing and why he is doing. She couldn't know the bigger purpose of God. You know, if she wasn't adopted by Mordecai, what would have happened? Mordecai stepped in and adopted his younger cousin and raised her. That's part of the, the providence of God as well. How did she find favor with Hege, with everyone around her, and then with this king who saw one beauty after another prance in front of him? And his eye set on Esther, and it seems that he truly falls in love with Esther. And I'm not saying he's a good guy. I don't think the text tells us Xerxes was a great guy. She knows something. Now, if this was a movie, I think at this point of the movie, if you were watching Esther on the screen, Esther would turn away from the camera, and she'd look at the audience, and she'd wink. And that wink would say, there's a bigger story going on here. Let's keep following the story to see what God is doing. And so Mordecai, Esther, 
Hege and Xerxes, less than perfect, certainly Xerxes, less than perfect, are the right people in the right place at the right time, and God is using them. And that's a big part of this story. The chapter ends with one of the many reversals in this book. Last week we saw how Queen Vashti was a, a strong-headed woman, seemed to be quite stubborn, and refused to do what her husband wanted at a banquet. It's a patriarchal culture. And for this, the crown was taken from her head. And it's at a banquet. Banquets become very important. Feasts are important in the book of Esther. Esther is contrasted. Now, here's the reversal. She humbles herself. She takes counsel from Mordecai, takes counsel from Haggai, and she throws, uh, I should say, her husband throws a feast for her where the crown is put on her head. The king does not even know his wife is Jewish at this point. This is going to become very important later in the story. We've seen the tension uh, between Daniel and Esther in this book and the importance of uh, keep, keeping distance from the culture and not getting too close to it. It's more clear in Daniel, less in Esther. Esther isn't perfect, but God uses her to save an entire nation. Daniel is much closer to keeping a distance from the culture, and God saves him from destruction. And what we say here is God uses both of them. We're going to end here. I'm going to ask that you stand. And as you're standing, I want you to think of yourselves individually, how God might be dealing with you as a person. How is God dealing with you in your life? Where has God placed you? Where has he positioned you? What are the people that are around you? There may come one time in your life where you are the right person, in the right place, at the right time, so God can make the right thing happen. That could be you. That would be your experience of providence, just like in the book of Esther.